So we spent a lot of time in our last video talking about how you can make your Cloud Firestore database even more useful with a liberal sprinkling of Cloud Functions. We talked about why Cloud Functions are useful, how they work under the hood, and we built out one function to remove some really awful language from our reviews. Whew, that's disgusting. But what else are Cloud Functions good for beyond ridding the world of fat-free dairy products? Let's dig into some common patterns for using Cloud Functions and think about how you might want to use them in your own apps. So I don't know if you noticed, but I'm a big fan of lists of five on this series. Ah, uh, remember those days? I had so much more hair back then. Well, it just so happens that today's episode also works nicely as a top five list. So let's start by talking about my number one favorite use for Cloud Functions, and that's using them as an alternate solution for when your security rules start to get too complex. For example, imagine we're working on a multiplayer chess game powered by Cloud Firestore. We'd probably have some kind of games collection, where each document contains the game's current state, a list of players, whose turn it is, and maybe like a history of all of our players' moves. So now when it's a player's turn, we'd want to have that client send up like the player's new move, the new state of the board, and maybe an updated history list. But there's a lot of information we can't entirely trust here. For starters, is this a game that the player is actually participating in? And if so, is it their turn? And is the move a legal one? Are they really appending their most recent move to the list of previous moves, or are they like secretly changing the history of the game? And you know, most importantly, does the state of the game board accurately reflect what would have happened when our player makes that move? Now, in theory, this is all stuff that we could handle through a sufficiently complex set of security rules. But I am not a fan of overly complex security rules. These things sit at the front line of your app. They're kind of hard to debug, and you've got players actively trying to break them. So my general preference is to keep these as simple as possible. So how can you do this? How can you keep your security rules simple while still allowing this kind of complex behavior? Well, this is where Cloud Functions can help. See, instead of having to worry about having our clients muck with these game state documents directly, my recommendation would be to lock these down entirely so that no client can modify them. This set of documents is going to remain read-only. Instead, I'm going to create a completely separate incoming moves collection. Now, when a player decides to take a turn in their app, they can submit their move by adding a document to this collection. And this document would be really simple, consisting of nothing more than like the player ID, the game they're looking to participate in, and the move that they want to make. But because of that, the security rules here can be very simple. We'll only let clients create new documents where the player ID equals their own user ID, and uh, well, that's probably it, right? Everything else can essentially be forbidden. Then, once this document has been added to the pending moves collection, our cloud function can take over. When it sees a new document, it can check and see if this game is active, if the player ID is in fact one of the players of this game, if it's the, really their turn. And then most importantly, our function can do all the heavy lifting of taking this move, making sure it's legal, and calculating the final state of the board for us. Now, because this is all happening server side in a secure environment, we know this is a function we can trust, which means that Cloud Firestore will let this function go ahead and alter the official game state document while keeping those documents completely locked down for our suspicious looking clients. In the meantime, if we assume that our clients still have real-time listeners set up on these game state documents, they can still go ahead and receive these updates as they're applied, so this change will get reflected pretty quickly in our clients. And you know, as long as we're here, you can still have your cloud function do some nice things like send a notification to your opponent using like Firebase Cloud Messaging to tell them that it's their turn. Now, the biggest drawback here is that you don't get all that nice latency compensation I was talking about a couple of videos ago, right? Like when you make a change to that incoming moves collection, we can't update your cache data right away the way we would if you were writing directly to that game state document, which means that you don't get to see the change reflected in your official game state until the write has come back from the server. It also means that if you're offline, that pending change will be queued up and sent when you come back online. And until then, your game will remain in its former state. But still, for something like an online chess game, I think these are reasonable trade-offs to make as far as the user experience goes. Now, going back to our restaurant review app, we'll probably want to update a restaurant's average rating every time a new review is written or you know, edited. But again, I'd be kind of nervous about having clients update the restaurant document directly. Not only do you need to make sure clients don't change fields they're not supposed to, you have to make sure this new calculated average is accurate and not some crazy extreme value. And that's going to be kind of hard to do with security rules alone. So again, this seems like a good opportunity for a cloud function to do that work behind the scenes for us. OK, let's move on to a second common use case for cloud functions, and that's keeping your denormalized data in sync. 
So going back to our restaurant review app, let's suppose that when we display reviews in our app, we'll want to include a little bit of information about the author, like maybe their display name and a link to a profile photo. Now in these situations, in order to keep our NoSQL queries nice and NoSQL-y, we would denormalize some of that data. Specifically, when a user writes a review, we'd probably add their name and profile picture to the review document. And all this is fine and dandy, but what happens when a user changes, say, the URL of their profile picture? Well, we not only need to change it like up here in their user document, but also in every review they've ever written. And yes, in theory, we could have the client do this for us, but I'm not crazy about that idea. For one thing, it kind of feels weird to have our client do this much processing on our database, you know, particularly given how flaky mobile phone connections can be. Plus, all that work involves extra data and battery costs for our users. And again, the security rules needed to allow all of this could get a little messy. So this is another situation where cloud functions might prove to be really useful. We can have a cloud function set up to run whenever a user document is edited. If it turns out that our user is editing their name or profile picture, well, great, our cloud function can run a collection group query against every review for which they're the author, and then change the author URL field in that denormalized data. And as I noted in an earlier video, this is something that could be made more efficient with batch writes or slightly more atomic with a transaction. Or heck, we could even combine this pattern with the previous one and not let users directly edit their own user documents at all. I mean, these documents might contain other information we don't want our users to mess with. Instead, they could write a document to a completely separate pending user changes collection. And then our cloud function could take care of both editing the original user document and changing all that denormalized data. Now, there is one issue here that we need to watch out for. By default, cloud functions terminate after they've been running for one minute. And that might not be enough time for your function to completely change all the documents it needs to if you had a really, really large database. Now, you can increase this default time to nine minutes, which will be adequate for most situations. But if you are running, say, a massive database with like millions or billions of records that all contain denormalized data that need to be updated, you could run up against this limitation. And at that point, you might need to consider other options, like standing up a separate cloud-hosted server and running the denormalization scripts from there. But even in those situations, you could use a cloud function to observe your database and kick off the script on your dedicated server when it sees that like a user document has changed. Now, on that note, let's move on to use case number three, which is using cloud functions to perform occasional database maintenance. Now, around this time last year, the Cloud Functions team added the ability to run your scripts on a regularly occurring schedule, basically like a cron job. Now, this can be used for a lot of different tasks, like generating weekly summary reports based on your data, but it's also a nice opportunity to keep your database neat and tidy. For instance, let's say we want to save drafts of restaurant reviews written by our users. Seems like a good idea, but maybe we don't want to keep these things around forever, right? Like at some point, our database is going to be full of half-abandoned reviews the way my life is full of half-abandoned dreams. The Distress Signal, a new novel by Todd Kerpelman. Chapter one. Lucy always won. Ugh, I give up. Your face like a... Ugh, not for me. Hello and welcome to The Snackable, our weekly podcast on all things snack real... I'm sorry, this is dumb. I just, I can't. Oh, that got, that got dark. So we decide, hey, let's remove any draft reviews that are older than, say, 45 days. But again, how would we do something like this with a client? We could ask every client at the beginning of the session to go and query every draft review that the user has and then delete ones that are older than 45 days. But again, that just feels odd to have your client doing that much work. And what are you going to do about people who uninstall your app and never come back? You want to delete their drafts too, and you know they can't do that if their client isn't using your app. So this is clearly a good opportunity for a cloud function to come in, query all of your half-written reviews, and delete ones that haven't been modified in the last 45 days. You can set it up to run once a night or once every couple of nights, and just like that, your database is nice and clean. And I'm sure there are other places we could apply this pattern as well. Maybe we want to use it to put old user accounts into an archive state when we realize they haven't been accessed in six months. Or maybe we decide, hey, we don't need to recalculate a restaurant's average review score every time a review is updated. We could get away with just updating all of our restaurants once a week instead. Again, something we could do with a cloud function, although an operation this big might run up against our nine minute timer depending on how popular our app is. If we reach that point, it might be worth having it update one seventh of our restaurants each day instead of doing the whole thing once a week. Okay, let's move on to pattern number four. And this kind of gets into something we haven't really talked about yet in this series, which is that Cloud Firestore is a fantastic NoSQL database. But for some of you out there, it's really less of a database and more like a super fancy real-time querying and caching service built on top of your legacy database. 
So yes, maybe for a restaurant review app or a chess game or some brand new app that you're building from scratch, it might make sense to have Cloud Firestore power all of your backend data. But what if you're an airline that's got a 25-year-old system running on existing infrastructure or a bank? Maybe the idea of completely wiping out your server with all of your existing business logic and regulatory compliance and all of that so you can start fresh with a NoSQL database is impractical. It's understandable, but you're also sitting there wishing that you could build an app with real-time updates and offline support and latency compensation with like an infinitely scaling backend, right? Well, this is where you might need to think differently about Cloud Firestore. For a lot of companies out there, particularly long-standing established ones, Cloud Firestore isn't the database that runs your entire infrastructure, right? It's the sleek new client-facing layer that lives on top of your old infrastructure, which allows you to build modern-looking apps. So imagine you are an airline that has like flight information and prices all stored in a decades-old SQL database hosted on your own personal server rack. And maybe you want to build an app that lets people search for flights and check flight status and so on, but the idea of exposing that database to millions of users at once is frightening. Well, what you can do is take that flight data, pricing information, and whatever else you think your users will want to search for and copy that onto Cloud Firestore, essentially as a read-only layer on top of your actual database. Seems like a good solution, but how would you keep all that data in sync? Well, there's a few ways to do it. As you know, Cloud Firestore has server SDKs that run in many different languages, and probably be pretty easy to write server code on your original server that updates Cloud Firestore directly whenever it has to change some data. It's a good idea, although it is a pretty tightly coupled system. Your code on this other server now has to know exactly how your data on this completely different system is organized, and if your Cloud Firestore engineer decides to make some changes without telling the other team, you're going to have a bad time. So in addition to Cloud Functions triggering when users write to your database or create new accounts or what have you, Cloud Functions also supports a service called Cloud PubSub, which is essentially a generic message passing service. So if you need to change the price of a journey or update the status of a flight, you can also go ahead and create a PubSub message, which essentially looks like some JSON describing what's changed. And after you've done that, you can set up a couple of Cloud Functions to listen to these PubSub messages. When a Cloud Function encounters one of these messages, it can go ahead and update the appropriate sections of your database as needed. Then your original database doesn't need to know how your other database is structured, it just needs to publish this somewhat generic looking message. Now, while this does mean adding another product to your workflow, it's a pretty useful one. The PubSub queue scales really nicely, allowing for spiky workloads that won't overload your system. It can be called from services that aren't running on Google Cloud, and you can add some fine-grained access control to your queue so services only get access to the events that you want them to. This also means it can be useful if you have lots of services, you know, not just Cloud Firestore, that might need access to this kind of data. And what about when your users want to write back to your database? How would they do that? There's a number of different ways. In some cases, like purchasing an airline ticket, you're probably going to need to have your clients talk to your original database. And you know they would do that with direct REST calls to an intermediary server or whatever you've got set up on that legacy system. In other cases, you might not need to communicate with your original database at all. Like maybe your users want to just take personal notes about their trips. For this user-only information, you could probably just keep it on Cloud Firestore. Then you get the advantages of the client SDKs, like offline support, which is probably important on an airplane, and this information can just continue to live on Cloud Firestore. But there will also be cases where you want that information living in both systems, like maybe a list of a user's favorite flights, for instance. You know, in those cases, maybe you want the convenience of making calls through the client SDK to your Cloud Firestore database, but you also need a copy of this information on your legacy server. Again, this is a place where Cloud Functions could come in quite handy. As your function sees that a new favorite has been added to a user's list of trips, it could make an outside call to your legacy system, which could then go ahead and make whatever changes it needs to, in order to keep the two data sets in sync. OK, finally, let's talk about one more interesting use case for Cloud Functions. And that's basically using Cloud Functions to build your own custom API on top of your Cloud Firestore database or whatever other infrastructure you might be running. So we've talked a lot about how Cloud Functions can trigger automatically based on events happening in your project, like a document being written to Cloud Firestore or a user account being added in Firebase Auth, and so on. But they can also be called directly. You can set up functions so that you can call them directly over plain old HTTPS. And yes, this includes get, put, post, request, the whole gamut. Or is that gamut? Gamut. And while that's pretty useful, Firebase Cloud Functions also comes with some pretty nifty client libraries that simplify this process even further using something known as a callable function. A callable function is, again, to oversimplify a little bit, a wrapper around HTTP calls, but one that reduces a lot of the work you would normally need in order to talk to a Cloud Function directly. 
For instance, if your user is signed in, that information is sent across and automatically verified by the server. So you can do things like perform user-specific actions without having to, say, verify any signed hashes on your own. And passing across data is as easy as sending a JSON object along with your call. Similarly, returning data is easy as well. You're generally just going to pass back JSON objects, which your clients can decode as needed. And if your function encounters any problems, callable functions do a pretty nice job of simplifying error handling as well. All this means that you can access these callable functions using code that looks almost as if you were calling some other local client method. No NS networking or volley code in sight. And that means you can quickly build up your own application-specific API using callable functions as a foundation. So where would you want to use these callable functions? Well, let's consider that chess example I had back at the beginning of this video. If you think about it, when we're writing that pending move document to the database, all we're really doing is sending a message to a cloud function. We're just recording that message inside a document as a way of passing that information over. But maybe we don't need that intermediary step. We could just as easily directly tell a cloud function, hey, this is the move that our player wants to make in a game by using a callable function. Now, as in everything in life, there are trade-offs here. On the plus side, we're no longer adding all these document rights to our database, and that saves us a few pennies here and there. It's probably also a little more efficient just talking to our function directly. But the drawback is that we've lost offline support. With the pending move document, that could still be stored locally on our device when the user is offline and then uploaded later when we come back online. But a callable function, that's just going to fail immediately, and we'd need to add our own custom logic to retry this call again later when the user comes back online. Now, another good example is to use Cloud Functions in conjunction with Cloud Firestore to query our database in a way that's difficult or impossible using native NoSQL techniques. Remember back in like episode five when we thought about how we would want to store a list of our users' favorite restaurants? One option we explored early on was to just store an array of restaurant IDs inside each user document. That felt pretty natural, but there's no way to have Cloud Firestore natively perform any kind of join that would give us the restaurant document included in that array. So we decided the NoSQLy way of doing this would be to create a completely separate collection of user favor documents where I could store the user ID, the restaurant ID, and whatever information I might need about this restaurant to populate a My Favorite Restaurant screen. And this is still a fine answer. But it's a lot of documents with a lot of denormalized data to keep in sync. And if it turns out the View My Favorite Restaurants page ends up being a feature that nobody really uses all that much, maybe I haven't gotten the best bang for my buck here. So another possibility would be to go back to my original plan of just having an array of restaurant IDs per user, and then having a callable cloud function do the work of grabbing this array and reading it in, and then fetching the individual restaurant documents based on the content of this array, and then sending all that restaurant information back to my device. And in fact, if you want to see me do exactly that, I have a whole other video series where you get to watch me fumble around in JavaScript and build a function just like this. It's linked in the description below. Go check it out sometime. Of course, by relying on a callable cloud function, I do lose most of the benefits of making a call through the client SDK. For instance, I can no longer make this call real time. It's going to be a simple one-time fetch call. And there's no native caching, so I won't be able to look at my favorite restaurants when I'm offline. And all that nice latency compensation, where we can first show the user their cache documents and then update them with values from the server when they show up you know, a second later, well, that's gone too. I have to wait for a complete response from my cloud function before I can show any results. At least, you know, not without building my own cache and offline support and latency compensation. But if you think about it, this might be a good minimum viable product type of solution so that I can quickly test out the idea of showing a user's list of favorite restaurants, and then I can see whether this is a feature that users actually care about. At a later point, if this ends up being a popular enough feature that is worth going ahead and expanding out this full denormalized collection, I can still do that, you know, once I've decided it's worth doing. And there's tons of other cases where a pattern like this might apply. Things like performing OR queries across different fields, or doing greater than or less than queries on one field and sorting on another, or even combining Cloud Firestore results with like results from other databases or services. You can bundle that up in one easy to call API thanks to Cloud Functions and Callable Functions. So hopefully, this has inspired you to take a closer look at Cloud Functions and consider how they might help you build more powerful, consistent, or cleaner Firestore powered apps. And then when you do, tell us about it. Have you used Cloud Functions in interesting ways? Let me know about them in the comments. I would be super interested to hear what you did. Thanks for watching Get to Know Cloud Firestore. And now, if you'll excuse me, I am late for a chess game. Queen to F2. Oh, you know what? This game's crap.